Welcome everyone to the RISE webinar on population health management. We appreciate you spending the time with us today. As we know, it is a very busy time for everyone. We'll start in a few minutes once people have had a chance to sign on. My name is Leslie McGeo and I will be your host for today's webinar. I'm a focal point with RISE and I work for Trillium Health Partners. Today's webinar is about population health management, a core concept for Ontario health teams. For some of you, these concepts will be new, but for others, this might be old news. We were on pause for a bit with the pandemic, but we are back today to reintroduce the concepts and discuss the supports that RISE has in place to assist OHT. As you join, please select the chat box in the right-hand portion of your screen Select everyone from the drop-down menu and introduce yourself and your organization or OHT. My colleague at RISE, Steve Lott, is also supporting us behind the scenes to ensure things are running smoothly. If you have issues with WebEx, you can message the host and he can try to help you resolve them. We will also have a Q&A at the end, so feel free to add your questions to the chat box throughout the presentation. We'll just give people a few more minutes to sign in. Hi, Patty, welcome. As you sign in, if you could add to the chat box your name and introduce yourself and your organization and OHT, uh, it would be great to get to know everyone today. We'll give people a couple more minutes uh, and then we'll continue. Okay. And as you sign in, if you just wanna add your name and say hello to everyone in the chat box, um, let us know your organization. We know there's people from, you know, across Ontario joining today, and it would be great to get to know you. Okay. We'll continue to move forward. But before we start today's meeting, we'd like to recognize the land on which we work. As we meet here today, we are in solidarity with Indigenous people of Turtle Island, and would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty land and the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and before the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Huron, the Wendat. We also acknowledge that many First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and other global Indigenous people who now call this area their home. We are grateful for the opportunity to be working on this land. The purpose of our meeting today is threefold. The first is to build awareness of the RISE Population Health Management Learning Program for OHTs. We'll walk you through the available supports and introduce your coaches. We will also hear from Ruth Hall at HSPN on how we are working together to support OHTs. We will hear from Rob Reed, who will provide a foundation to help OHTs achieve the first steps in implementing a population health management approach. We also want to share learnings from other OHTs and allow time for you to ask questions. Today, we will hear from Georgia Whitehead from the Mississauga OHT. There are three main supports RISE will be providing OHTs to help them implement a population health management approach. The first are webinars, which will provide foundational population health management training through a combination of didactic content, expert panel discussions, and OHT sharing their learnings as examples. Topics will align with ongoing OHT requirements and will adjust to your feedback. They are open to all cohorts and are available monthly. Coaching sessions will follow the webinars and will build on the webinar content. They are open to cohort one starting next week and to cohort two in May. These will be one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with each OHT. We are recommending one-hour meetings bi-weekly. However, 
you can work with your coach on a frequency and a timing that is right for you. The coaches will act as facilitators, providing resource access, mentors, providing change management recommendations, and as traditional coaches, helping you to solve problems. Collaboratives are the third support. Collaborative meetings will follow your coaching session and further build on the webinar content. They will be an hour and a half each month and will start in February for cohort one and in June for cohort two. Monthly meetings will be a combination of peer sharing and open dialogue. The intention is to learn from one another and solve problems together with the coaches. We will also include and leverage expert groups such as OPCN. An online space is also available for questions and discussions between meetings and for coaches to share resources. We recognize many of you are challenged for capacity right now. The timing and content of all these resources will be adjusted based on the feedback we receive from you. We'd like to quickly introduce you to the RISE Population Health Management Coaches. They are here with us today. Unfortunately, we aren't able to introduce them individually today. However, please say hello to them in the chat box. This group of coaches represents 80 years of coaching experience in a variety of healthcare settings, including primary care, specialty care, hospital, and long-term care. Next week, the coaches will begin contacting Cohort 1 administrative leads. The initial discussion will include gaining an understanding of where each OHT is in their population health management implementation, identification of learning opportunities, and determining a coaching schedule that works for your current level of capacity. Before we dive into today's learning, we'd like to do a quick poll. If you could reference the right-hand side of your screen and click on the drop-down for polling, please rate your level of familiarity of population health management concepts, one being a low level of familiarity and five being high. This is going to be helpful for us and for the coaches as we continue to build content for upcoming sessions. We'll just give you a couple minutes to fill in the polling. Just reference the right hand side of your screen and click the drop down for polling and you can select We'll also continue to connect with you through coaches, collaboratives, and surveys to ensure the content is meeting your needs. So we'll continue to stay in contact with you, of course, beyond this poll. So I believe this poll will continue to stay up. You can fill it as you come in, and we'll check it at the end. I'm now going to pass it to Rob Reed, who will walk us through the population health management core concepts. Thanks, Leslie. And uh, it's so nice to see um, everybody today. Um, it's nice to connect with many of you. And many of you I don't know yet, but hopefully will over time. Uh, my name is Rob Reed. I'm a health uh, uh, systems researcher at Trillium Health Partners, and I'm one of the co-leads of the RISE platform. And my plan today is really to reintroduce and anchor you in the core concepts uh, and the work of managing health and populations. Uh, we introduced this earlier this year. Uh, we were delayed uh, a little bit with the uh, pandemic, and now we're uh, reintroducing this again. Um, I'm going to walk through an example with you. And as we've come to learn over the last few months, addressing the challenge of COVID-19 is all about managing disease and risk in populations. And so we've, we've really needed to take a population-based approach to limit spread, to manage disease, and now to vaccinate our population. Uh, so COVID-19 uh, is actually the example that I'm gonna select today because many of you are living these, uh, these uh, population-based concepts right now, and it's a good opportunity to, to uh, um, anchor us in, in this thinking. Uh, more on that in a bit. And don't worry too much if you don't get all of what I talked about today. Our coaches uh, will be working with these concepts with you over time. On the surface of it, population health is a really simple concept. Improving uh, health of the entire population 
and making sure no one's left behind. And so that is not just about improving the health, the average health of the population. It's also improving equity um, and, and making sure that vulnerable groups and, and people, and their needs are also addressed. Um, so it's about everybody in a population. It's not just uh, about users. It's about people who don't use the systems as well. Um, and so while the concept is really quite simple, um, it's actually quite slippery and hard to put into action. So let's dig into um, the, uh, the uh, concepts a bit more and think a little bit more deeply about how health systems produce health in populations. Um, and I introduced this curve before. It's a frequency distribution of health in populations, um, this curve. And, uh, and I really wanted to divide this curve into three groups, three subcurves that build on each other. And it helped detail the work that OHTs uh, uh, need to do, and that's where this story is going. Okay? So the first curve is the black curve at the bottom, and this is really around uh, uh, preserving and enhancing the delivery of timely, high-quality acute care services. Um, this is the work that Ontario, that many people in Ontario uh, do really well already, okay? Stroke care, care for heart attacks, care for pneumonia, uh, these, these uh, delivery of acute care services um, in ambulatory or in uh, inpatient, uh, inpatient settings, hospital settings. The second curve is the, ye the yellow curve is really a big focus for Ontario health teams. And I'm gonna call this the clinical population health management curve. And this is all about, rather than acute conditions, this is all about managing ongoing health conditions and risks over time. It's about focusing on users as well as non-users, and it's about pre proactively reaching out to them if they fall off the map. So this is an active management program and a big focus for OHTs. And then the third uh, curve, the blue curve, is largely not about healthcare at all. It's squarely on the upstream uh, socioeconomic determinants of health. And it's where healthcare collaborates with public health, cities, community partners to address those, um, those uh, um, issues, okay? If we uh, go to the next slide here, Leslie, um, this is these last two uh, um, um, curves are really where the focus of OHTs are, the clinical population health management and then the population-based uh, uh, policies and interventions. Um, uh, okay, so let's move to the next slide here. And now I want to just talk a little bit about how we put those uh, curves and managing those curves into action. Um, we need to take a population-based perspective into designing and deploying services and policies at two levels, at the level of the individual and the level of the, of the population. And recall this slide uh, when we talked earlier this year, um, and it talks through the four main steps of managing health in a population across those curves. And that defines the work um, of, uh, of OHGs. And I'll keep coming back to this slide over and over again. The first um, is all about getting to know your population with data. Okay? It's dividing up it into groups, or what we call segmenting it into groups, with, with people with common needs, um, and then understanding the risks and barriers uh, to delivering services so that you can actually tailor services appropriately. And the second step is then, then designing a service mix and pathways to care uh, for each of these segments, right? um, and then proactively applying them to those populations over time. The third step is to implement the models across the populations in ways that they have reached into those underserved or vulnerable populations. Um, and the fourth is really around monitoring, evaluating, and adjusting. Uh, today we're going to focus on the first two steps, and there's more, on, on the, more of this to come in, in future webinars. Okay, so let's start with step one. And this is about segmenting your population and characterizing it. And as we know with OHTs, we're not talking about geographic populations. We're talking about attributed populations. And we know there's significant overlap in the two concepts. But this, is, this uh, uh, pyramid is really um, uh, uh, to reflect the overall attributed population that you've all gotten to know uh, quite well. 
It's a very simple diagram that visualizes how you might approach stratification. And I stole this from Kaiser Permanente. It's the Kaiser Permanente Risk Pyramid. It depicts segmentation of an entire population. It starts with healthy people at the bottom in green and then moves up in terms of complexity to the very complex patients that need uh, management at the top in the yellow bucket. It's, it's oversimplified, uh, and certainly, but I think you get the idea that what you're trying to do is divide the population up here into different segments based on need. And as you move up the pyramid here, health needs, risks, and complexity increases. And so does the intensity of required, uh, uh, intensity of care that's required, often by more than one partner in OHT. And thus it, it, it really means uh, more and more needs for care coordination and care management as you go up the pyramid. Okay. Just, this is just another schematic around that characterizes the work that you've already been underway. The first step is already what you've taken. And, um, and this is just a schematic. Um, so it's really trying to divide your population up um, over time. And you've already de de um, determined what your priority population will be within your attributed population for at least year one. Um, and then within, uh, within your priority population, and many of them have taken, many of you have taken more than one or large priority populations like seniors. The next step then is to divide that up into, into groups of people with similar needs characterized by that. And then the third step, would to be characterize those people in terms of their additional barriers and risk factors uh, to determine the, the needs for the different groups of people. So this is just a schematic to help you with your thinking. Okay, so let's go now to pop the second step of population health management. Once you've stratified your your your, your population and your priority, whether it's a, your attributed population or your priority population, and now let's think a little bit about how you might design the service mix and pathways for that, okay? Um, this is a, a, earlier this year, I presented uh, the chronic care model as a way to think about this design. It's developed now over, I think, 25 or 30 years ago now. Uh, its evidence base is very solid and it's used across the world in terms of designing uh, health system interventions. Um, I wanted to reintroduce it to you now because it's very useful in terms of uh, to design your care models, your pathways, uh, that are proactive, team-based, and population-oriented. Um, the model components um, are really, the, in blue here, are the health system components. And we'll go through them in some, a little bit of detail in a second. And then there's also components that, uh, that uh, work at the community sector, and those are the yellow components. All interact to, to assist with uh, care teams and patients to achieve better outcomes, efficiencies, and experiences. Okay, so uh, rather than making you squint to try to um, to try to read those little um, circles, um, I've taken the blue ones out here and just uh, just uh, blown them up here on the side. The f uh, and I just wanted to walk through them first. These are the components to think about the care design that you're going to do um, or that you're already doing. The first is around delivery system design, and this is all about new roles and new tools uh, across the OHT. It's about developing mechanisms for proactive in-reach and outreach, those functionalities. And it is actually then around mechanisms to identify and address barriers to care. So it was really changing your care model here in terms of who is doing what um, to make sure that um, um, you're, uh, you're managing the entire population. The second bubble there is, uh, is this, uh, clinical decision support. Um, and these are needed so that care is consistently done at the front line. And this is the use of care pathways, best practices, POPs, reminders uh, around care. The third is around clinical information supports, clinical information systems. These are the, 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 the information systems that are needed to achieve the prior two. And this is the, about the use of registries trackers, uh, other IT functionalities that you're beginning to build in your Ontario, Ontario health team. And then the fourth, and it's one not to forget about, are around the self-management supports. And this is really around 
interventions that help assist patients in the population to build motivation skills capabilities for, for behavior change, either for managing chronic uh, conditions or around uh, things like stocking, stopping smoking um, and, uh, and, uh, and, and so forth. Okay. So that's all I'm going to say about the second component of the population health management uh, work that we're doing. Um, the third, uh, the third and fourth um, steps. We're going to detail these more in later webinars. Uh, and, and in the meantime, for teams that are beginning to begin implementing uh, your population health management and want to dig into these, your coaches can help you with this. The third step is really around implementation and research, and it's about developing a project project logic model um, or driver diagram that can help put you uh, put um, small tests of change into place. Um, the fourth step is really around revising your project logic model based on the results of these small tests test and, and for about ongoing uh, monitoring and results. Okay. So that's the, the, the brief overview um, that I was getting, get, wanting to give you on population health management. Um, and, um, and then I'm, uh, I, I want to uh, go to the next slide, um, Leslie, and show you um, – um, th this, the, these are the supports that we are uh, uh, building to help you with this. And both RISE and HSPN are providing supports here. Um, we've walked already through some of the supports that we've talked about RISE, these webinars, the coaching, and the collaboratives. And HSPN is also helping OHGs with some of the work around segmentation and evaluation. And Ruth Hall from HSPN is on, uh, on our webinar today. And I'm going to hand it over to Ruth for a couple minutes just to describe the supports that HSPN is providing to you as well. Thanks, Rob, and uh, welcome, everybody. Um, yeah, this is, we thought it would be a great opportunity as many of the OHTs are getting uh, maybe bombarded by uh, all the supports that uh, have been made available. We just wanted to share with you the synergy between what um, HSPN and the Central Evaluation Group are doing and how it connects with what uh, the population health management uh, focus of RISE is. So HSPN is really about um, understanding how to segment your attributed populations across the entire province um, and identifying some priority populations. And, the, and RISE is going to allow you to uh, work with your own individual uh, priority populations and learn how you can figure out the segments within those uh, priority populations where you're going to be redesigning care, uh, monitoring your um, efforts and outcomes of your patients um, and providers maybe and, and um, caregivers. And then, and we are also involved in the monitoring and evaluation um, component uh, for population health management in that we will be um, identifying and calculating the metrics for each OHT's uh, attributed populations on a broad, uh, broad reaching uh, metrics. You're going to hear more about this on our evaluation webinar next Tuesday, and I hope all of you will attend to, to listen on that. We're calling these the improvement metrics. And um, we will be calculating them for, again, at the overall population, attributed population. And then we're also going to be doing some metrics on the most common priority populations that have been identified by the OHTs, that being palliative mental health and addictions and the older adults, frail seniors. And we're largely uh, using the administrative databases available to us through ICES to uh, give this um, the best we can do at a comprehensive level across all OHTs uh, on these metrics that are uh, manageable. But we're not going to give you hundreds and hundreds that appeared in your data packages, but um, much more focused. And again, you'll hear more about that in our webinar next week. Whereas RISE will be um, helping you to develop your own metrics more proximal to, to what you're doing for your priority and subpopulations within that priority population. And you may also be using some administrative databases, but highly likely that you'll be using your own um, OHT-specific data, your 
patient registries are going to be critical uh, to help you track your work and evaluate it and uh, shift things as uh, your outcomes come back to you for feedback. Thank you and uh, look forward to seeing many of you there on Tuesday at the HSPN uh, evaluation webinar. Back to you, Rob. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ruth. And so, uh, as you can see, we both are playing in this game and uh, and trying to help uh, groups, both HSPN and RISE, uh, OHTs, and and uh, we're we're um, making sure that we're we're coordinating. So, if you have any questions, um, that uh, uh, please do contact your coach, and they'll put us in in touch. With, you'll be put in touch with the right people that can help you. Um, now I've sent I've um, I think Ruth and I have talked a, a fair amount about concepts, models, and steps that you think about to use, and I think some of this will be a complete review to most to many of you, and some of it might be quite new to others. Uh, but all I know is that what I've talked about is quite abstract. It's about ideas and concepts and models. And so what we we would do right now is I would take you through an example um, um, to, to really look through what this looks like in an example for a, a, a one population or, or one issue. And um, the issue, the one thing I promised you earlier that we would consider actually looking at COVID. Um, and um, you know, there's nothing more population-based COVID that, uh, based in terms of managing than COVID is. And it's a really nice example of how you might walk through a population health management approach. And we've, we've learned over time in the last six months that we really need to take this approach over time. Um, you know, it, the example I'm, I'll walk with you uh, do today is more about what we want to do rather than what we're completely doing. So this is an idealized state of what if you were to start with population health management for COVID, what would you do? Um, and it might give you some ideas about what you want to do if you're, if you're actually dealing with COVID in your OHC right now. So if we go back to the original diagrams that I had and that frequency di distribution of health and populations and the three curves, I want we would just spend some little time just thinking about what the curves are around COVID um, and how to manage a population re relating to this. So um, uh, let's re go back and rethink what those curves are. And the first curve is really around caring for people who have COVID, moderate and severe disease. So this is the acute acute care sector problem. Um, and uh, the challenge here is to really provide timely access to hospital care, to deliver what we're growing to know is effective in terms of managing the patients with, with, uh, with COVID to reduce mortality, things like uh, uh, new medication, the application of steroids, for instance, intensive care and different maneuvers we might be using there like proning uh, and ventilation is appropriate. So this is really around managing moderate to severe uh, to, uh, to severe case, uh, COVID in our hospital. Uh, and because volumes in many of, in many of our um, areas are, are pressed and we're, we're growing, we have uh, capacity constraints on here, the focus is really to, has been to maintain uh, sufficient capacity um, across our systems that are responsive to these changing needs. And I know many of you are working on this, things like ICU capacity, staffing, PPE, and now vaccination um, uh, of our acute care settings has been, has been central. Um, and we know that data and monitoring and population-based modeling are also key so that we can plan um, for these capacity challenges because we know that COVID, uh, in terms of its prevalence, goes ups, ups and down, ups and down. Um, we also know that other population-based practices within those acute care environments are also key, uh, such as IPAC principles to, to promote our uptake. And, uh, and it would be remiss of me not to just hold, to stop at this moment uh, and just kind of really thank people I know that have been working across Ontario for the vast months, putting all this into place and to those frontline providers who are actually delivering uh, this care. It's been a tremendous amount of work and, uh, and I uh, and, and most of the other uh, people in Ontario really, um, uh, really thank you for that. Okay. So let's move on to the second curve then. Um, and the second curve um, in the clinical population health management for, for COVID could be conceptualized as caring for patients now with asymptomatic or, COVID or, or mild disease at home. Um, and we've got to know how essential it is 
to bring people in early, get them tested when they develop symptoms, um, and uh, identify COVID, and then provide supportive care within those environments, often virtually, um, at home, and monitor those patients at home for deterioration, and now, unfortunately, for persistent disease and long COVID. Uh, The focus has been around limiting spread to others with preventive measures and proactively tracing close contacts to ensure that they're informed, uh, quarantined, and tested as well. And we've also learned over the last few months how important it is to apply an equity lens to this work and to address barriers such as not having, such as uh, 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 unstable housing or having no, no paid work uh, leave to actually manage this uh, group uh, with, uh, with mild disease at home. Okay, and now let's just uh, talk about the third curve of population health uh, management. And everybody now has become very familiar with, these, with this thing. This final, this third, this curve has become uh, uh, natural to us now. Um, and it's all about population-based policies and interventions to, detra- to, to address and focus on healthy people so that they, we, we limit the transi- transmission over time. It's about education around uh, public health behaviors, physically distancing, wearing masks, socially bubbling, and so forth. It's now um, we're extending into a vaccine and really uh, uh, dis- figuring out how we're going to prom- distribute and promote vaccine uptake and actually address vaccine hesitancy in our populations. Uh, non-medical uh, strategies are key here, um, and it's really uh, we know that how important it is around community engagement, education campaigns. Uh, uh, we've become very familiar now with uh, travel restrictions, mask mandates, um, capacity limits with restaurants and so forth, and unfortunately with lockdowns as we're in right now. Uh, uh, we've also know, uh, began to know how important it is to address the underlying social risk, social risk factors um, that promote transmission, um, inadequate housing, um, uh, and, and, and so forth. Um, and the healthcare uh, community has a significant role in this, um, and it's really to align, um, provide, and advocate uh, for services and programs at public health, social services, and other community agencies. So there's a significant role in, in, in this curve now. And with COVID, um, uh, we are managing all three of these curves simultaneously because uh, that's absolutely critical to kind of um, uh, to, to get this pandemic under, 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 uh, under control. Okay, so let's go to the next slide here. So I want to take the, to talk a little bit about now, we've, we've, set, we've discussed around um, the roles of healthcare in these three curves. What do we do to, what do we need to do to address these? And so if we take this population-based management approach and apply it to, to the, the COVID, um, it can give some clues as to what we actually need to do. Okay. So if we go to the Kaiser Risk Pyramid and now apply COVID um, to the Kaiser Risk Pyramid, um, uh, we, we, we determine how we might segment the population into different groups, right? Um, and how we might need to characterize those groups. Um, everybody is at risk for COVID. Uh, and so the, 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 the at-risk population is the entire po- attributed population and not some groups. And so if we look at the Kaiser Risk Pyramid, um, at the bottom of the Risk Pyramid is, um, is uh, a persons at risk for COVID. These are people not with COVID, but we're, we're really trying to prevent transmission in this group. The next group is with people with mild or asymptomatic disease. Um, the, third, the third group is now hospitalized patients. Um, and then the fourth group may be those who unfortunately end up in the ICU. Um, and at least our hospital, um, uh, you know, that's a significant number of people these days. Okay. Uh, and um, as you can see in this, this Kaiser Risk Pyramid, um, as you move up um, the pyramid, uh, the care needs, the, the barriers, the complexity actually increases um, uh, and, uh, and, uh, um, and so forth. Okay. So this next slide is really around now the objectives. What are we trying to do here? And part of the objectives is not, a, not only to manage people within those strata, but it's actually promote, reduce the risk that people are moving up this risk pyramid uh, and reduce the likelihood of infection and then reduce the likelihood of severe disease of, on those that are infected. Okay. So 
if we think about risk segmentation, then what are the data that we would need to segment people in the way that we just talked about? Okay. These are the uh, so, uh, uh, population health segmentation framework that was just published uh, la a couple of weeks ago in one of the uh, established health services uh, or, or, or medical journals that really tried to articulate what this would look what this would look like. And many of us are already doing this uh, work, and you'll, you'll see, we, we know it's happening. First is to, to actually we need data on um, on the personal experiences of COVID. Who actually has COVID? Who's had moderate, mild, and severe disease? And we have population-based trackers now to actually identify that. Um, and now over time, we're actually going to have to start looking around what the sequelae of, of COVID are. Um, and so be able to track that as well. Um, the second is that we need, um, we need risk factor data to be able to determine that either at, a, either at an individual level or a community level, uh, and both the risk for infection as well as the risk for severe disease. So things in terms of risk, risk for infection, we actually already have now is some community level data on prevalence of, of COVID, um, levels of exposure. Um, we know that certain occupations um, uh, promote uh, our, our risk factors to, to COVID. We've grown um, to be well aware that living circumstances is one of the biggest risk factors to COVID. Um, in terms of uh, congregate living and homelessness. Um, social, other social factors are also risk factors, um, so, so, such as uh, 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 public transportation, daycare, uh, discrimination. And then, and then finally, we've all be, we all know about health behaviors um, and how important they are in terms of reducing the risk of transmission. The risk of severe disease has also become much clearer as to which individuals are at risk if they get COVID who will actually develop severe disease that needs to be managed? And it's clearly related to older age, chronic illness, weak immune systems, pregnancy, obesity, and certain med medications. These are, are also risk factors, but not in the infection part of it, in actually in the development of severe disease. And then we also have to not only, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, d determine um, the COVID area, we actually have to look at non-COVID related needs uh, because individuals have other needs as well as, as COVID um, and, uh, and, and because these haven't disappeared in terms of their acute illness needs, their chronic illness care needs, diabetes, um, and, uh, and, and for instance, cancer care, uh, mental health and addictions. And we've all become very well aware around how important mental health is in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the management of COVID preventive care, child and maternal care, palliative care, and the like. Okay. So if we were to develop a, um, a, a stratification framework, we would use these com this complexity of, of, of factors to determine how to design systems uh, for particular groups of people. Okay. Where might these data come from? Okay. And we actually have these data places already in place in much places in Ontario. Um, so we have now available laboratory testing data. We are generating in, information out of uh, EMRs in terms of these risk factors and, and, uh, and disease states. Uh, we have administrative data sources like uh, um, that, uh, like uh, um, Ruth was talking about, that can give us per community prevalence like rates and the like. We have registries now in, in other intake data, for instance, in the vaccine programs that we have in way now. Um, we've developed, um, um, uh, we have available consumer apps and person-generated data. We now are generating a significant amount of data around contact tracing. And we have a lot of data from now emerging from our public health partners around community risk factors uh, that are there. And it's really now, it's not that there's a data shortage in Ontario, it's really assembling those data um, to, to enable us to, um, to, to uh, stratify the populations uh, according to those risk factors. Okay, so let's just now talk. So let's say we've stratified our groups into those three different groups uh, that we know change uh, over time. People move from one to others. So what would we do now to design care strategies for those different groups of people? Um, and so let's try taking the chronic care model here and applying it to um, these different segments. Okay, so let's go to the next slide. And so this is just an example of how you might think about using those 
different segments now and designing your care models around those things. Uh, and so we've got the three curves here uh, that I was uh, just using. So in hospitals, for those severely ill people around the acute phase of their uh, uh, moderate or severe illness, we know that a significant amount of attention needs to be done around the care model redesign for, those, for that group of people. So we've been experimenting with virtual emergency departments, hospital COVID wards, airway teams, new IPAC protocols, new, new, new um, mechanisms to do virtual visiting, and now mechanisms to do acute care follow-up in the community. Okay. Um, realize how important it is to have now clinical decision supports for that group, such as um, uh, um, uh, um, and, and contact tracing protocols, patient trackers and case reporting. And then uh, in terms of self-management support, really uh, patients and communities need a guidance in terms of how to manage COVID. And so we've, we've actually having to provide uh, much more educational resources around this and, and visitor guidelines and so forth for that, for that first curve. In the second curve, exactly similar things that we're having to do to manage that group of people. And this is now about uh, virtual assessment centers and testing, ILI clinics that, uh, that I think um, 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 our Mrs. Ontario Health Team is going to talk about in a second. Um, the development of virtual care strategies uh, so that patients don't have to leave their home and they can come in. Uh, monitoring, for instance, using uh, pulse oximeters at home for, for monitoring for worsening symptoms. Um, and, and the likes. So I'm not going to walk through all of these things, but you can clearly uh, build your programs around these people if you take this, um, this, uh, these curves and the chronic care model to actually articulate it. And then finally, if you look at the non-COVID uh, group, the people that were, were trying to prevent COVID from actually occurring, we can actually also take this chronic care model components and design our strategies within within those components as well. So this is just an example. Clearly, um, this is um, complex, uh, but I just wanted to walk through the thinking about how you might take a segmentation approach and a, um, a, uh, a care design approach using a population-based framework for the application around COVID. And many of these things you're already doing. Um, you're absolutely um, doing all, many of you are already doing them in some mix. And now it's just putting them into a coherent whole for the populations that you're serving. Okay, that's uh, all that I wanted to say. Um, I think um, um, I'm going to pass it now over to Georgia, uh, Georgia Whitehead. And Georgia Whitehead is from the Mississauga, Ontario Health Team called Mississauga Health. And she's going to talk a little bit about some of the interventions they've done in populations, particularly around COVID. Thank you so much, Rob, and thank you for your presentation today. Um, hi, everyone. As Rob mentioned, my name is Georgia Whitehead, um, and I am the uh, director supporting our Mississauga Ontario Health Team uh, Collaboration Council as the OHT director. And I'm really here today. I'm a partner, particularly our primary care partner, who spearheaded um, this initiative. Uh, and so, really want to recognize Somerville Family Health Team. CarePoint Health, the Credit Valley Family Health Team, and the Mississauga Halton Primary Care Network, um, who who have really who really spearheaded the initiative. So to give you a bit of context, and I'll pull back to the presentation and some of the frameworks that you referred to, Rob, and going through here. But you know, providers and operators on the call will know that COVID-19 creates several barriers for patients with uh, seeing patients with COVID-like symptoms particularly for small operators um, due to IPAC challenges of small spaces, workflows. Uh, I, I know particularly in wave one, PPE challenges, um, education related to that. And this for primary care um, who are smaller, for smaller primary care providers, this is a particular challenge. And we knew was going to be something that we would face in the Mississauga region um, with the, the makeup of practices. Um, and in addition, our primary care leaders were thinking about uh, health equity and recognizing that this, um, the difference in the way in which all of us as operators were responding to the COVID-19 pandemic was going to have an impact 
on changing and, and differential access for people. And so the idea was really making sure that we had primary care um, coming together to think about how could they work together and um, integrate their their work, their assets, their um, ideas to prepare for um, an access point that gives an alternative to the emergency department for, for those who have symptomatic, who are symptomatic. So maybe COVID-19 could be another um, uh, acute respiratory infection, could be something that's presenting like COVID-19, and their other alternative would have been the emergency department. Um, and so they really, the primary care leaders came together, integration and partnership was really key, um, and said we need to build a, a cough and flu clinic um, that is staffed and supported and organized through the collection of the resources that we have at our disposal um, and is going to be available to anyone who needs that service. Um, and I do want to acknowledge, um, Rob, in the suite of different types of services that you identified, um, I know there are others within our neighboring um, areas within Mississauga and elsewhere that have stood up um, clinics and services to service the same population. And I, I also want to acknowledge the sharing of um, knowledge and information in setting up these um, clinics and in doing it so quickly was really paramount and Ontario Health as well in their support and sharing information and models across. And so I think that um, the community's practice as we're thinking about response, um, there are a lot of commonalities and there are a lot of local differences, uh, but that had a was a huge benefit um, in getting this off the ground um, as well. So if I go through a little bit of, um, give you a little bit more on the what. So this is a cough and flu clinic um, for symptomatic patients. This is, these are for people who need to see a doctor in person, but would otherwise be unable to see their primary care provider. It provides both um, testing, but also in-person care. So clinic assessment, diagnosis, um, and treatment and support to connect back to other types of services as the individual needs. Um, one of the, the, the picture that you have here on the slide of, on the side of your screen is a map and thanks to Peel Public Health for the uh, uh, prevalence and hotspot maps, which we use regularly in the OHT um, to guide planning. This is what we were looking at back earlier in the fall to understand prevalence rates and selection of location. Um, and this is something that we continue to monitor and think about what are the right places to make sure that we're getting access um, to this type of service to the right um, areas based on risk within the Mississauga community and partners across Mississauga are, are focusing on those efforts together. Um, one of the other things um, I, you know, I, I wanna mention, and maybe I'll just go to step one, um, is that like everyone or many others during the full application and selecting our priority areas, um, we, we did not have COVID-19 on the radar at that point, but we were taking an approach of understanding within the, um, within the, the risk factors that are maybe the three curves, I'll refer to Rob, the three curves that you used earlier, one of our priority areas was really thinking about the group that's in the second curve that is, um, it's in the community, it's before hospitalization, and really thinking about how we can get care um, to individuals who would otherwise be presenting to the emergency department. And that was one of our focus areas. We were thinking about those with um, gastrointestinal or genital urinary uh, minor acute issues, and we, and we said this is the moment we need to think about pivoting with respect to COVID-19, but it remained within one of our priority um, areas in terms of the population, and so that allowed us to move quickly um, and reorient our plan and build on our plan for this specific population. Um, one of the other changes I would say that we made in, in around step one was to think about the, the population when you're looking at a COVID-19 um, at-risk population. As Rob, you mentioned, everyone is at risk of COVID-19. And so it was really important as we thought about the cough and flu clinic and the approach we've taken provincially on assessment centers 
to ensure that anyone who has access to um, or anyone um, who needs this service has access to it and that it was not bound by um, where you are rostered or any particular pilot population. So if we just go to the next slide. One of the unique features um, that really came out of the co-design approach uh, was in, when building this with the pri primary care partners and particularly um, primary care across all practice types through our primary care network. This resulted in a really important um, approach that supported continuity of care. So as people um, come to the clinic, uh, physicians across the community can refer into the clinic and people can also call directly themselves if they don't have a primary care provider. And through the clinic um, with diag diagnosis and treatment, uh, the clinic um, shares information back in a loop back with the primary care provider and has that complete full circle um, of information to make sure that uh, the primary care provider can continue from there and supporting, um, supporting that individual in their needs. It also involved, um, we were really, it was really grateful for the relationships with a few patient and family advisors and putting this together through the OHT that were able to come give advice on the model, were actively out helping us identify space and resources um, through other community connections, um, and were really involved in thinking through the, the branding there are a lot of services that um, I know we were all standing up and we have been over this year and helping people and the community understand what this is um, and when they would come here was important and our patient and family advisors were critical in doing that. In step three, um, I would say, and I, I, I'm sure this resonates with others, everything within COVID-19 response is rapid and condensed. And, you know, I'm presenting this in a clear linear pathway, um, but we know that in, in the moment you're really moving through and trying to make sure that you're thinking through all of these pieces while going rapidly. And continuous improvement has been a huge component of this to say, let's get started, let's not wait, let's get started and, and monitor and evaluate see how we're doing and build and scale from there. And so that has been very much a part of the approach. And I will say, I recall the um, four steps to planning from uh, the um, RISE's presentation uh, at the Provincial Forum last January, and that framework to make sure that you're, we're capturing each of those components, the segmentation, who are we serving, co-design, how are we actually um, thinking about reach, and how we're changing um, our, our work on an ongoing basis and understanding how we're doing has been an incredibly helpful model in this. Um, and I know one that we'll use going forward. So I just want to thank RISE for sharing that with us. Um, the, the last piece maybe I'll say is there's a lot, of, a lot of work around monitoring and evaluation and connecting back to some of the data pieces that, uh, that Rob, you, you spoke about, refer, looking at where are patients coming from how are hotspots changing, and how are we continuing to evolve our model and think about some of the structures and processes and learnings that have been set up here, how we think about that for future populations um, beyond COVID-19, uh, even things like our vaccine preparedness planning and how we take some of the lessons of population health planning, population health management, and, and the work of this clinic to guide us as we work as a community to, um, to continue the response. So I know, I hope that gives you a little bit of an overview of the cough and flu clinic, but really how we were trying to tack back and forth to the, make sure that we were using this as a moment to build our skill sets in population health management and build on that as we go forward and build the OHT model. Um, so I'll, I'll hand back to you, Rob. Um, for any further further questions or, or comments from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, George, that's just terrific. So thank you for sharing that. And and you know, you you guys have just done a terrific job at at doing things very quickly, 
learning how you're doing it, trying to understand who you're targeting, how you're de redesigning the strategies going forward. You're taking the principles and just applying it. And, and I know that you're not the only ones in Ontario doing this. And I've heard just, just really good things from other OHTs doing similar work, doing similar things. And uh, it's just terrific. So thank you, Georgia, for joining us today. And I'm going to hand it over thank back you. over to Leslie. So we'd actually like to leave time now uh, for the audience to ask questions of our presenters, so of Rob, Georgia, and Ruth. Um, please add your questions to the chat box, and we'll also take a look through the questions that have been coming in through the presentation. So our first question is for Georgia. How are you thinking about applying these learnings to your other priority populations? Yeah, that is a um, great, great question. So there, there are maybe two frames within which I'll answer that. The first is there are going to be um, structures and processes, whether that be workflows, connections, thinking about like referrals when you do need them either to transfers to the emergency department, for instance, or connections to specialists, how we work with um, um, partners around connection to advice on social services um, to support people during self-isolation. There's great work happening um, in our community by Peel Public Health, by SHIP, by others on isolation centers, for instance. Um, and so as we build those connections, those are things that we're going to be able to transport to other populations. So some wonderful foundations that we can build from. In addition to that, I think there are some smaller things that practically make work um, easier in the future and it can accelerate your um, implementation and growth over time. So, you know, things like our uh, project and agreement templates between partners being established that we can build from in the future. It just reduces the barriers as you, as you go forward and try to open new services together. Knowing that this is a moment where we've demonstrated together what we can do, how quickly we can work together, that this being one of the first new services delivered under the OHT, all of these moments as firsts and enabling tools and competencies that we build are going to help us in terms of scale and spread going forward. And I think my colleagues um, across the province and OHTs who have um, responded in similar or slightly different ways, I think we'll have great, I'd love to hear different learnings and lessons and ahas that they've had. Um, um, so we can do that reflection together on what goes forward. But those are some things that come to mind. have one more uh, question and time for one more question, but if you do have additional questions, please feel free to add them in the chat box um, and we can use them to inform future content. So the next question we have is from Rob. For Rob, if we haven't started thinking about segmenting our priority populations yet into subpopulations, uh, where would be a good place to start? Yeah, this is a terrific question. So this is actually uh, one of the first things that uh, we wanted to have you talk about with the coaches is actually how uh, you might think about segmenting. You all have different populations that you're working with as priority populations. And so you have to take an individual approach appro approach around how you're, how you're approaching it. And you have to use the data you have to be able to inform the segmentation strategy. So I would really encourage you um, to, as your, your coaches uh, um, start connecting with you, as, as you're describing uh, what you're planning on, uh, what your, your plans are, uh, they can really help you think through a segmentation approach. And we'll be doing more work on that in the collaboratives. Today, there was a couple things we wanted to highlight in terms of upcoming activities and events. So as Ruth mentioned, we have the HSPN OHT evaluation webinar on January 26th. We also will have the next uh, in the series of the population health management webinars in March. And then for cohort one, there's a couple activities for you. Uh, we'll post this in the chat box as well. So if the administrative leads or the population health management leads could complete the survey in the attached. 
It will help us to know whether or not you're interested in working with the coaches. Uh, the coaches will start reaching out next week to cohort one, and we will also be sending a poll to set and confirm uh, the first collaborative meeting, which we'd like to hold in February. In prep for that first collaborative meeting, uh, to give you the most value out of that session, we do recommend you think about choosing one priority population and thinking about how you further like to segment it. We've also included a list of resources here, which we'll post in the chat. And we will also post this webinar shortly for you uh, on the RISE website. We want to thank you all for your time today. We know you all have very busy schedules. Uh, we hope you have a great day, uh, and we welcome future feedback for future sessions. Thank you.